All right, everybody, welcome to the uh, labor support for carbon pricing session. We're first going to start with a poll here. So when you see the poll, um, you can give your answer so we get a sense of how many people, what kind of background people have to unions and labor, and then we'll get started. All right, well, thanks for participating in the poll. We'll, we'll move on now to start with our um, introductions in our uh, labor support for carbon pricing session. And uh, to introduce myself, I'm Linda Vernoy. I'm a co-leader of the CCL Labor Action Team. And I'm also a steward of the American Federations for Government Employees, Local 2782. And I appreciate the work that unions do to protect workers. And I believe that um, good climate policy is good for workers. So now I'll introduce our panel members. Uh, first, uh, we have Johnny uh, Zugar, who is um, President of the American Federation for Government Employees, Local 2782, Council 241 in Maryland, um, which covers the whole Census Bureau. And Johnny is um, committed to servant leadership. And um, his mantra is true change begins with oneself. Uh, and his local supported a um, clean air resolution, um, which includes carbon pricing. And uh, then I wanna introduce uh, Mark Ailes is a CCL volunteer in Illinois. Um, he's a member of the American Federation for Teachers, Illinois Federation for Teachers, uh, and he obtained the uh, national endorsement for the American Federation for Teachers for carbon pricing. And then we have uh, Kyle Bouchamp. Kyle Bouchamp, unfortunately, we've had some technical problems with his video, uh, but you'll be able to hear him. Uh, he's a CCL volunteer in Kansas and a science teacher, member of the National Education Association, which is the largest union in the country. And, um, and he's a dad and his family lives uh, near Wichita, Kansas. Um, so that's, um, that's our panel members. And I'm gonna start by asking the panel, um, what, um, what would you say are some of the intersections? between climate and labor. And anyone can talk, just uh, un unmute yourself um, if you're a panel member to share your thoughts on intersections between climate and labor. <clears throat> oh, and, and sorry, before we get into the panelists talking, if you have questions at any time for our panel members, uh, you could put it in the chat under, you wanna send it to ask me, Peter Handler, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Okay, go ahead, uh, panel members. What's the intersection between climate and labor that you see? Well, all right, I'll just jump in now uh, so that I don't interrupt somebody else in a second. Uh, first off, I'm really sorry that my video isn't working, everybody. This is the first time that's ever happened to me, and I'm still uh, trying to figure out why. But uh, I even wore my NEA shirt uh, to show that I'm a member of the, the NEA union. But anyways, um, as a teacher, I uh, wasn't really educated too much about climate change. Uh, through high school or even college. Um, but as I've kind of woken up to how serious the issue is, I've kind of changed my perspective to, from thinking that this is the kind of issue where, you know, teachers can help to change the world by you know, moving the needle a little bit and in a generational kind of way, problems get solved. And that's kind of how I thought about a lot of things. And that was part of the reason I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, but with climate change, it's, it's clear now, it's, it's here now, and it's a lot more serious and emergency uh, type issue than that kind of approach can handle. And so as I plugged into any, uh, sorry, as I plugged into CCL um, September before last, uh, toward, towards the end of summer, I guess, um, I was just kind of fumbling around thinking, what are all the things I'm connected to in the world where I can help to bring about the changes we need and find support for these good bipartisan policies to help move them forward. And I stumbled across across the labor action team and they kind of <laughs> smacked me upside the head and said, well, you're a member of the largest union in America. And so I made some phone calls uh, to the NEA office in my state uh, after having a not very fruitful meeting with our local leader. And they forwarded those phone call uh, voicemails, uh, since nobody was in the office to take them during the height of the pandemic, on to 
national and now we've been meeting uh, the labor outreach action team that is has been meeting with an executive director and senior policy analyst with the NEA and we actually have another meeting coming up this Wednesday um, and so the connection for me between uh, labor uh, at least for the union that I'm a member of uh, and climate is that this union has a humongous amount of political power and they really need to be using it uh, exercising it to bring about the best possible things in a timely manner because as a teacher and as a dad I'm deeply concerned for the future of my son and my students that I've been teaching. Great thanks Kyle. How about you Mark or Johnny what do you see as the intersection between labor and climate? Yeah I'll take that one. Um, I mean I personally think about it as uh, labor and climate. I think the two are interchangeable in the sense of like, um, we all have kids, we all have families, we all want futures. So I think it's taking labor some time to come around to it, but you know, climate issue is labor issues. You know, we, for example, if we look at what are the future of jobs, they're not gonna be in some of these um, things that of the past. You know, for example, we, we talked about coal jobs. Well, what if, what if we change that to a re um, uh, renewable energy? things like that to give people high paying jobs, but also helps the, uh, the economy. We also look at labor in like the certain jobs, our teachers, our schools, our bus drivers. So we can refit all these, our whole community to deal with climate change and, and then lower carbon if we just look at it as a labor issue, because again, it affects us in the way of our health, our, our economy and our world. So I just believe that um, the intersection is just interchangeable. Like it, it has to be one of, one and one, not really like it's labor and it's climate change. Well, it affects you in every part of your life. So I think there's a great opportunity for labor to look at it and, and partner to make changes in the law, but also make change in our community. So that's my excitement about it. That is something that we can do in the next 50 years and keep working on. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, Johnny. I have to say Johnny is also the president of my union local. I appreciate his his vision, his ability to listen to members and uh, and his commitment to the matter. So Mark, um, what would you have to say about intersection between climate and um, labor? Yeah, well, I, I couldn't agree more with Johnny and Kyle. Um, and, and I think it's, when I look back on my teaching career, you know, it used to be that the teacher wanted to just teach some material to the kids and not have to worry about anything else. But uh, clearly, the, the, um, that was uh, not correct. And we've matured and learned that the environment that the kid is in makes a huge difference for his education and his future. And so when we're concerned about his environment, then the, the teachers and the union is concerned about the environment that the kids are learning in and the teachers teaching in. And clearly, climate is having a big impact on that. I didn't realize when I was teaching all these kids that had asthma and other health related issues were, were affected by the air pollution that was in large part uh, caused by climate so and fossil fuel emissions. So I think that the connection between uh, unions and the health of their children and their families and their futures is, a, is an easy fit for uh, trying to make changes in uh, the climate. Great. And um, continuing with you, Mark, can you talk about why the American Federation for Teachers is supporting carbon pricing at the national level? Well, I think that, that, that both the NEA and the AFT, as I mentioned, are concerned, of course, about the environment kids are learning in. And so they've always had an interest in that. And so there is some uh, in the union organization that they're, they're, that they're concerned about the climate, both for the kids, the teachers, and the community, that, that it was an easy um, move to think about what climate change is affecting it, how it's affecting it. So and in my particular case, I, I was just sort of, because I was a union member, I was asked to, to try and get my local to, uh, to you know, take some action. And I had already done a presentation to my local. And so the, uh, I had a connection with somebody at the state level. So I just contacted them and said, hey, and they were the person that was involved 
in both the political um, agenda of the um, Illinois um, Teachers Association and also in the environment and what has to do with, uh, with uh, the environment of kids and communities. And so pushing her to do something at the state level just got her to say, well, would you be interested in them doing it at the national level? So I just sort of stumbled into uh, uh, something that the AFT, because of the work of Citizens Climate Lobby and other people in the labor action group have done that they were ready to, to move. And so then uh, we got both the uh, endorsement of the Illinois Federation of Teachers and the American Federation of Teachers. Great. And we should mention, um, we were excited by that because um, AFT is the largest union in uh, the AFL-CIO, affiliated with the AFL-CIO. So right. that was great, uh, a great step. Now, uh, Kyle, um, you've, since you mentioned, you talked about how you started the conversations with the National Education Association at the national level. What would you say are their perspectives um, of the NEA at the national level on climate and on carbon pricing in, in, in the previous conversations you've had with them? Yeah, good question. Um, so from their website, if you go digging a little bit, you can find that they are uh, aware of the climate issue. They have some you know, publicly acknowledged concern about it and uh, want to see some action taken. Uh, they have been supportive of Build Back Better. Uh, I think it's okay that I say that. Um, there are a lot of climate provisions in Build Back Better, as we know, uh, or there were, I guess, uh, as it's kind of dissolved. Um, at any rate, uh, they, they're friendly to a lot of climate policy and the politicians that promote climate policy. Um, but when we met with, um, his name is Justin, when we met with our guy in June, he um, kind of took the, sorry, some just dinged. Um, he kind of took the request that we uh, have them look at the Energy Innovation Act and carbon pricing uh, to their government relations or government affairs. Uh, I think they call it GR. And uh, they unfortunately declined uh, to endorse the Energy Innovation Act at the time. Uh, we weren't given a whole lot of reason for it. And so the, the question remains, you know, why they aren't, uh, yeah, he said at that time. So you know, maybe that'll have changed by now. We'll find out soon. Um, the question remains why they're not promoting carbon pricing for all the catalytic power that it uh, provides to help drive the economy in the right direction and kind of bolster some support for all the little changes that they do want and you know very vocally advocate. So like Mark was saying earlier, um, you know, the environment that students are in affects all sorts of things in their lives, uh, their health and their mental health and their ability to learn. And so NEA has been um, pretty active trying to get, you know, electric bus fleets and carbon free schools and cleaner communities and all this. Uh, but so far, at least in my opinion, they have been um, a little bit quiet as far as overarching and, you know, national and global policy. And so I hope that uh, we're able to move them uh, on that. Great. Um, all right, so Johnny, uh, as a labor leader, what, um, why did you support when our local uh, had the uh, clean air resolution come up, um, which includes carbon pricing? Why did you support that going forward? Again, I have a deep belief in, you know, you know leaving the world in a better place when we, leave, when we leave here. You know, so I think we have a responsibility for the community um, one, I trust you, you, when you brought it to us, I know that you have a passion, you wouldn't bring anything to us that wasn't, you know, good. And then I, as I did my research, as I thought about it, um, in a conversation with my wife, you know, she always doing recycling. She always talking about the, the, uh, you know, the community and, you know, the climate, she's always talking about that. So I was like, you know, this is an opportunity to put, you know, some teeth behind that. 
Then I look at things like, you know, you look at the Texas uh, Climate Project, where they're going to invest, uh, you know, they're looking at trying to create 1.1 million jobs in um, solar energy. Uh, and I think about the people that we represent in Indiana, the average salary is $35,000. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, well, what if these people can make 55000 65000 75000 85000 Their whole um, world in the sense of how they live can change and they can do something good. So as a laborer, it's just trying to reframe in my thinking that you just don't sit back and look at just a contract because a contract is one thing, but it's another thing is a responsibility about the whole community. So that's part of the reason why I support it. And then it just got me excited, something different. And I just, you know, I got a nine year old, I got an 11 year old and a four year old and um, they grown up in this world. So what's, you know, what's gonna happen 20 years from now, 30 years from now uh, when they are, you know, adults and trying to live their life. So that's my responsibility. Great, thanks so much, John. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter now. He's gonna share any questions that people have from the audience. And if you have questions, please submit it to in the chat to Ask Me Peter. So Peter, you can unmute yourself to ask any questions for our so panel I think, members. I think we had a, an issue early on with um, uh, being able to access the chat for um, questions. I, it, it is working now. So if people have um, questions at this point, um, please um, put them in. Um, I have a few. Um, uh, this panel is basically a panel of uh, white collar unions, which represents clearly a very uh, the, some of the largest unions in the country, um, but also um, only one part of the union movement um, and, and not the blue collar um, unions, which is a, a very different perspective of where people are coming from. And uh, um, I wonder if each of you as union members, even though this isn't what you do, have a perspective on how blue collar unions might look at the same issues um, as your, you as individuals and as union members. Well, I can okay. say, sorry, Tony. Um, I, I could say something I'd like, Johnny, I think might be able to speak to this better than me, but, um, I, I, would, I would just say that uh, um, uh, a blue collar union, of course, has to look out for their union members. And so the question is, are there going to be uh, jobs and benefits for those individuals? So certainly some of those unions, like electrical trade unions and other things, can see um, benefits uh, that they can move toward. And, and we're hoping that those unions are going to look into the future and see what kind of jobs are going to be available, like Johnny was talking about earlier, that they could maybe transition to. But the other thing they need to push for, of course, is legislation to make sure that that um, that the unions that are going to be affected negatively by the changes have some um, have some funds put toward retraining and moving them to areas where they're going to um, be more successful. So I think that we can we can encourage blue collar unions to look at where they can move to most benefit their members either different jobs or different um different funding from the government to help them transition sorry i muted myself all right good point um johnny or kyle either of you want to address that <clears throat> I guess I'll go now. Um, well, for the NEA, uh, I think I would like to see them uh, kind of promoting policy that will, uh, you know, shift not too much. You know, education's, uh, this is a blanket statement if I've ever heard one, but our education system isn't all, isn't all bad, uh, but there needs to be some little tweaks maybe uh, to what we're preparing our students for uh, in terms of
climate change and in terms of jobs that are needed, uh, you know, the work that needs to be done to address climate change. There's there's a lot of work to do. You know, the, all these jobs pay good money, and uh, that's great. And they're also kind of not optional. That somebody's got to do them if we want to keep our way of life, and uh, you know, with, with a good economy and still have a habitable planet. And so I hope that NEA will help, uh, you know, kind of guide uh, curriculum towards the you know, preparing students for life uh, in this age. Um, trying to think if I if I come up with any other ideas I'll share but I'll I'll pass the mic to Johnny. You look at a case study in West Virginia with the coal miners. Um, we can when we talk about legislation we talk about language it matters. So if you say to someone, you know, you go back in 2016 election, you look at the conversation that was said, it's saying to the person, hey, climate change, that should be everything to a person that's just trying to eat this food on their table. So I think you have to rethink how you like the language behind it and think about that person, you know, if I'm a blue collar person or whatever, you know, I'm trying to put food on my table. The first thing. So for me to think about something other than that first, you know, that's a privilege for that other people have. So how do you now learn and have those conversations to say, hey, you know what, you can do both. Matter of fact, you can put more food on your table. At the same time, you can help the, uh, this is what's going to happen to your children and things that you can benefit for your family. You know, I think if you don't take the time to have those conversations and we just say, let's back this bill. You know, when a bill fails, say, well, nobody cares about climate. No, it's not that. You still have to educate people and tell them there's some other effects that happen sometimes. And I think, Linda, this happened to you when you brought it in front of our members. And someone says, tell me what's going to happen to the <laughs> to those citizens of West Virginia. And, you know, we have to have those answers, you know, and those answers, you know, with Senator Manchin or any of these people, it can't be, well, I'll go, you know, we'll, we'll think about that later on. I think it has to be part of the bill and market to the citizens of like, you know, Appalachian and these places and tell them why it's good first. Then and we can kind of deal with uh, climate change. So I just think it's a two part um, dance. Um, I think, Thanks. oh, Kyle, did you have? No, I nope. think he had he addressed it. Yeah, go okay. ahead, Peter, if you have uh, more questions. Uh, I, I think, um, Johnny, taking off from, from what you've just talked about, um, for probably the first time in our lifetimes, we have a president who supports unions, which is, is kind of amazing in itself, especially thinking back to, uh, you know, a President Reagan, who tried to get rid of unions. Um, and a, a large part of the union movement, um, you know, as it's been talked about, is pretty protective of its members and, and with their perspective is this is all about jobs, which is true. Um, and uh, uh, as uh, unions tend to support each other, um, from that perspective, um, I know that the president of the AFL-CIO now talks about um, that unions need to be part of answering the problem. Um, and, and, you know, the AFT is the largest union in the AFL-CIO, but there are many, many, many other unions and blue collar unions in there. So um, as kind of an extension of the last question, what I would ask is, um, as union members and union leaders, um, how do you, do you see the potential, and if so, how, um, in your regions or on a bigger level of reaching out to other unions to try to bring them in? Anyone want to address that? Um, I'll take a stab at it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we absolutely need to, right? We, we need a lot more of these unions uh, on board with the climate policies that 
um, CCL promotes. I, you know, I trust that we're all pretty fond of them. Uh, you know, they're they're not perfect. Uh, there's there's imperfections, but there's always things that you can tweak a little bit uh, to try to make them a little bit more palatable to different unions. And so, what we're doing with the labor outreach action team uh, to those that aren't members of it uh, is, you know, approaching our unions and saying, uh, well, this this is the bill, and if you would like to see uh, some transition assistance for the people in these industries, uh, that's not in this bill right now, but you could contact uh, the sponsors and co-sponsors of the bill and say you would like to see it and your voice will be heard. Um, and then, yeah, we, we absolutely need the you know, chorus of all those other unions. Uh, my dad is in the IBEW, so I've been trying to get him to join CCL and in, in here to the labor uh, outreach action team. Uh, he's, he's very uh, big in the union side of things. I, I forget what his actual title is, but he's, he's not the president, but he's, uh, he's pretty high up in his local union. And uh, I think that once you learn enough about uh, the, the transition to clean energy uh, for an electrician, there's, there's not really too much um, inherent alarm about doing it. You just need to kind of help hold the hand of the people uh, making this policy and guide them in the process so that it ends up uh, good for all of your uh, union members. And I think that that's just a, an anecdote of my dad, but I think that's true for a lot of these blue collar unions. You know, the, the net benefits are huge, right? We, we all know that. Um, what we're doing now, we can't keep doing and when we have to do something else. So it's just a matter of showing them uh, this is the way and, and helping them to uh, use their voice and encouraging them to use their voice to uh, bring about the policy changes uh, that we need. Great. Do you have more questions or does anybody else want to address that? I'm, I'm going to address it. I, I think um, there's a lot of work to be done there because when we definition of a union meaning that we're united. And I think as when we talk about, um, we keep dividing ourselves, blue collar, white collar, we're Americans and we workers. You know, regardless of what you do, you can contribute, you contribute to the fabric of America. So we have to just learn each other. I mean, the last administration, you had the carpenter union. These people was looking for uh, more work, so they wasn't against climate change, but they was they supported the president because they looked in for work. While we have some other unions was like, you know, hell, hell no, I'm never going to talk to you. So it's one of those things where you have to, you know, go from organizing, which is like, hey, sending out like tweets and stuff like that, or a little text message, just to real engagement. Because when you engage, you're going to find that most people want the same thing. And I think sometimes the, 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 the unions that support the climate change need to put an olive branch to people that don't know about it and really engage them and talk to them about reframing their thoughts, looking at this whole system to say, OK, here's how you can benefit with your members. But that takes time. That takes relationships. So I think we got to get back to what unions were in the past where, you know, we're greater, you know, together than apart versus now we have these blue collar, carpenters, electric. Well, you know, I look at the union as a body. You know, if I don't have my brain, my heart don't work. You know, so all these things are the same. You know, you can, if you don't have the carpenters union, you don't have the electricians, you don't have the professionals, all these things makes America work. I just think, I, you know, what I've seen is a lot of divide, you know, and I, what I wish to see is like more of the union coming together with an agenda that affects climate change, but also affects jobs for whoever it is on that thing. So that's what my struggle is when I've seen in the past. Great. Yeah, let me Please. let me just uh, add on to what Johnny said that, yeah, it, that um, as a CCL member, if you're a member and you're in the, and you're wanting to know how, how do I reach out to unions to try and make a connection and a difference? Of course, the first thing is to try to find a, mem a union member that's in CCL. And, and then if you, um, and, and then like, like Johnny was saying, try to make those one-on-one -on -one connections with people in that union so that you have a personal connection and that they feel um, 
a little bit of trust between the two of you. And then you might, then you might talk about some of the benefits that you would get from either um, the, this bill or some, some possibly some companion bills that CCL supported in the past that, um, that, uh, that would particularly affect that union. So those are ways that you can make those connections and make, uh, and make um, some sort of inroads to get them talking to you and then maybe supporting uh, the bill in the future. Great. I can also mention, um, since it's a, our group is um, not too big, if you wanna ask your question personally, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. So um, go ahead, Peter, if you have more questions. Um, Kyle, the one that, that I would um, ask as it taking off from what you talked about is um, your father is uh, a member of the IBEW local, um, assuming that that's, I don't know if that's near where you live or not, but um, is it possible through your father to engage uh, discussions directly with uh, IBEW, whether it's talking about carbon pricing or just talking about uh, more broadly issues of uh, climate and climate legislation and the IBEW, um, the work that the electricians do? Um, that's a good question, and I am not sure about the answer to it. Um, as we all know, you got to find the right messenger for these things. And so my dad would be a great messenger uh, if I could get him to talk. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to, so I might have to find a different messenger, if you know what I mean. Uh, but uh, certainly there are, there are people uh, who aren't, at least aren't hostile, who are willing to listen. Uh, about this climate change stuff and this transition to, to clean energy stuff and can hear us out and hear the, the arguments and some of the, the nuance of you know, how this transition could work and how we can uh, kind of support people in the industries that you know, must be killed <laughs> or at least left to die. Uh, some of these industries can't, can't continue. And so uh, they have concerns uh, naturally about what's going to happen to the people in these in these fields, but you know it's it's not a given that they are left behind to die with the industry. So I think we just have to find our right local people, uh, and this goes for me uh, trying to work in other unions. Um, the IBEW is the one that I've been thinking about because you know electricity's going to be pretty important in all of this. And my dad is in, in the IBEW. And so that's kind of been my natural, you know, next horizon. But for each of you kind of thinking about, well, if you're, if you're in a union, start with that, I guess. Um, but thinking about your, your social circle and the people that you have positive connections with, I guess, uh, try to make a little Venn diagram of the people who are friends of the, the Holocene climate and friends of labor, uh, you know, a union member and try to get uh, some of those people that you know to, to work in their own unions, to, to be a voice to their union leaders, you know, to, to go do like I've been lucky enough to do at the NEA, just uh, you know, throw something at the wall and see if it sticks at least. Any more questions, Peter? Anyone else want to raise your hand and ask a question yourself? I mean, one, one, one thought. Um, mm -hmm. When we had our Mid-Atlantic Conference a few years ago in Atlantic City, um, uh, we were physically there and we had a panel that I moderated on, on uh, climate and labor. Um, one of the panelists was uh, uh, a uh, Teamster leader in Philadelphia. And um, his, his response in part was, I have seven grandchildren. I, I, I know the world that they're going to grow up in. And he said, what, what my members want to know is, is the price of diesel going to go up? So it becomes 
you know, it's, it's uh, as, as Johnny said, it has a lot to do with, you know, how it, it becomes very personal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the part of the end, part of the question is um, how we bring about uh, a fair transition. Um, CCL, God, I think about eight years ago, had a report from a group called Remy that talked about uh, when the uh, energy innovation, well, it was carbon fee and dividend then got passed, that there would be a great increase in jobs. And one of the issues that I have with the report was that a lot of the jobs were going to be in healthcare. Well, other than physicians, the jobs in healthcare would probably be much lower paying than the jobs that would be lost in the fossil fuel industry or the industries associated with fossil fuels. And of course, that also relates to, um, you know, automobiles um, with the move that um, the president is pushing very hard right now toward EVs. Um, uh, Somebody said to me that a Tesla has 17 moving parts in the drivetrain. So what that means is um, even with way ramped up production with the UAW, that uh, it's, it's a lot easier to build an EV than it is to build a uh, fossil fuel powered automobile or other vehicle. The maintenance is much less. So uh, what we're looking at is a very broad restructuring of labor in this country. Um, and it isn't just, well, you lose a coal job, there's another job, because those, it's a matter of geography and people owning houses and living where they live. And um, uh, um, it, it's not a simple, one for one. Um, I do have a question here. Can you speak about how climate change may be affecting workers in your union now? I want to uh, discuss that. Uh, was the question how is climate changing effect? How is climate change affecting workers in your union now? Yes. Now, yeah. Okay, well, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, it's made it a lot harder uh, as a teacher. Um, in 2018, I believe it was, there was that uh, big bomb cyclone that came through the Midwest. I don't know if you guys heard about it over where you all are at, uh, but it dropped a ton of rain uh, all along the Missouri River. I was living in St. Joseph, Missouri at the time. I just moved back to Kansas this summer. Um, and as a river adjacent city, uh, about, uh, well, I can't remember the number of people now. Uh, some hundreds or thousands of people's homes were flooded. You know, some of these were my students. Uh, as you can expect, they probably weren't paying attention in class if they were even in class at all. Uh, some of them had moved across the river to family on the other side. So they weren't able to get over, um, the, the water was too high. And that's just, you know, one little example of how it's affected students that I've been teaching, right? And this is happening other places. There's uh, teachers whose students are uh, dealing with wildfires and wildfire smoke. And, you know, this is a huge stressor and a kind of a deeper level of the brain is focused on climate change and your survival then is focused on abstracts of math and physics and uh, these other things I've been teaching. And I, I can't help but wonder, uh, you know, how much, you know, uh, ability or freedom is, the, is lost of these students to be interested in these more, you know, luxurious uh, <laughs> mental indulgences when there's the the constant threat of climate change hanging over your head. And uh, I think that's just going to get worse and worse. You know, um, I just hope to limit 
how bad it gets, right? But it, it's absolutely going to get worse. It's gonna be harder to educate students. And, and I'm a human being too. And as a teacher, I have my own worries and it's hard to prepare good lessons and be thinking about uh, you know, educating these kids for these careers if you're depressed and worried about is the world ending. And so, you know, climate change is a really serious issue for educators and their students now and in the future. Anyone else want to address that? I'll address it. So I will take it not beyond who we represent, you know, because I don't, I don't, I don't do my role as just dealing with people I represent. I do my role as the, you know, um, just serving anybody, any human being that's next to me. You know, um, you know, being a part of the union, not part of the union. The significance is you want to serve, and we look at our. We have a uh, field reps, people that knock on doors for census. They are like thousands of them across the country. I, I can tell you, um, in the West Coast, in California, the fires. It, it really affected those people. Uh, uh, people that were uh, employees that work down south in Florida on the Panhandle, all the the storms and stuff like that. It affects them how they get to work. It affects them every day. We have employees that um, if you go to Pennsylvania, there's parts of Pennsylvania economically depressed, where there's so much pollution outside of or outside of Philadelphia, going into the suburbs out there, where you know you look years later, people have cancer, people have uh, asthma, all types of stuff going on in these places. Um, and normally what happens is a business says, hey, you know what, we're gonna bring tax revenue. We're gonna show up there. People say, going back to this whole jobs thing, every good job is not a good job, <laughs> you know, and they bring that there. Um, and people do what they have to do because they're trying to survive. You know, these workers, they, you know, even though their fires and that fire goes away, the smell, they still don't go knock on those doors because if they don't, the way they get paid is they have to show up. So it is affecting people on a daily basis but a lot of times these people are, we call the unknown. You know, they don't have anybody speaking on their behalf. They don't have anybody really, you know, um, you know, just saying, hey, it's good. So a national union or everybody else, they talk about jobs and it's like abstract jobs, jobs, jobs. But if you look at what, what, you know, what happens when people don't think about your future, it catches up to you. So even when you talk about like Tesla, you know, but what is the job of the politician, the job of the leader is to rethink 10 years from now. So you're not trying to hold the employee hostage because it's like either you like climate change or you lose your job. What did a person choose versus giving them a different narrative alternative to say, hey, you know what, we can we can really make sure we still have jobs in America and we can solve climate change because look what everything else we did in the last 200 years. You know, so I think it's just kind of rechanging the narrative like that. But um, I just I look at it that way in the sense of like people are going through it every day. Um, and as a union person, you should serve everybody. So I, I connect it that way. Yeah, I, I have another question um, I wanna address. How, how is your union using their political power? Cause we've, um, we know that in op Open Secrets, you can find out there's uh, PACs that's affiliated with every union and these PACs uh, donate money to the um, political candidates. And um, all of you CCL volunteers, you can find out from Open Secrets if uh, any of the unions are, um, which unions are donating to your particular candidate during the election cycle. Um, and for example, if AFT donates to them, that's not something you want to bring up in a meeting, but it's you know something you can you can mention to your uh, political representative that AFT supports carbon pricing, for example. So in general, you know, what are your thoughts? Anyone can speak up about how your union um, uses their political power in the political process. Yeah, I would say AFGE uh, is kind of one-sided. They look at people's voting records on federal issues, but we don't. Ex it's not expanded to like climate and other issues. It's kind of like very narrow scope. So it's like this person voted 100% or 80% with us on these bills, um, you know, raises and, you know, issues, you know, issues of the government. But I haven't seen like a very expanded viewpoint of uh, when you get the person that you're donating to record. The record is normally on like our worker issues that deal with uh, like federal worker issues. So that's what I've seen so far. I haven't seen like a like we're talking about the full 
voting record. You know, it's usually like a things that only deal with our type of work like that. So that's what I see with us. Anyone else want to add something to that? Uh, I, yeah, I was just going to say that um, I agree again that uh, um, the, the union is focused, uh, like the AFT, for example, is focused on educational issues and they want to know what, what uh, issues are going to affect the teachers and the teachers in the classroom. And so that's what they're mostly focused on as a union. But uh, as Linda and her in the, in the labor action team used that information, as she was saying, to in, in, uh, um, in lobby meetings, you just to, to tell the, the congressman that there's a lot of support for this bill, including the you know, AFT. And so you, you don't have to say that we know that the AFT gave you a lot of money. <laughs> You just say that AFT and other organizations are in your district are supporting this bill and trying to get some influence that way through the CCL. Okay, Peter, any other questions you have yeah. or anybody want to um, raise their hand? So a question is, what are the employment opportunities that may arise from um, mitigating um, or adapting to climate change? Who wants to jump in and talk about that? Oh, uh, real fast. I mean, we're just making the world a less habitable place, right? It's it's becoming inhospitable, and that requires a lot of human engineering, a lot of uh, redesigning of our physical environment, from the buildings we live in and the you know banks of our rivers to the air conditioning systems in our homes and and all this different stuff uh, has to be you know super powered uh, because what worked 50 years ago isn't going to cut it anymore. Uh, the floods are higher, the heat is hotter. And so there's a lot of, you know, physical work that has to be done uh, if, as far as resiliency and adaptation uh, goes. And then, um, you know, hopefully have some, some good mitigation too. <laughs> Anyone else want to address that question? I think it's a diversity of jobs. I think it's not not one job, or uh, I think it's you know when you talk about solar and wind jobs, you know, uh, is it is it is also a diversity of skill set. You know, it's it's from um, where you, you know the the barrier to entry is low and it's high. You know, if you're talking about someone that's going to re look at our, our, our grid, that's that's a different like that. So I think the goal is to take this back to the high schools and back to the schools and, and start to have those conversations of what type of jobs and things that's needed. I think, you know, just as we, in the 1950s, we started, you know, uh, change, you know oh, car, like in, we have BMW went from doing bombs to cars, you know, change, changing like very true innovation like that. It's like saying to someone, you know, hey, yes, you're not gonna make a Tesla no more, but it's, you know, you're not, you, maybe you don't need that many people to make Teslas, you used to make a GM. But the same skill set and mindset of making that GM can be can be energized into, you know, new windows and new, you know, school buses that's more efficient. Like different things that we can do. I just think we need to kind of not like box people in, um, and you know, but understanding that it's like it's it's a lot of different diversity of jobs. And I will say too is if you've been in you know working in GM for thirty years. We shouldn't let those, we can't say, well, they can't learn. Well, no, I think your brain, in my opinion, I'm not, you know, I'm 42 years old, but I think I'm smarter than I was 22 years old. You know, so I think, and I, and I said, Jen, I think if I'm, you know, God willing, I'm 62 years old, I'll still be smarter. And those people can still, you know, um, contribute you know, like that. So I just think it's a diversity of jobs. And if we're committed to it, we, people can have their picking of what they want to do. But I, I would take away the word jobs and say diversity of lifestyles, because it's, I think it's going to be deeper than just like, oh, a job. These people, if you think about Detroit, that was a lifestyle. That was who, part of who they were, identity. They worked in you know, the auto industry. So now when we talk about the auto industry like, it's her, like it was the old days, because we still have an auto industry, not as big. But imagine talking about, you know, wow, you're doing the climate industry. You're working in that world. I think that can change the way people think. Yeah, I, I, oh, go ahead, Mark. You were going to say something? 
I was just going to say one other thing, and that is that you, you wouldn't want to dwell on this, but of course, you, you might mention that um, what's the alternative? If, yeah. you, if, you do, if you do nothing, you know, what's your world going to be like? And so um, you need, what, what you need is you need something to spur this process, to spur innovation. And guess what? The, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is something that could do that. Yeah, I have to mention that even right now, um, somebody in our DC chapter has mentioned that the Department of Energy is hiring a lot of people. So for people who have those skills, there is money already that's been put in the infrastructure bill to update our energy infrastructure. And some of that's gonna help us with clean energy. So those kind of jobs are already out there. You have another question, Peter, or does anybody wanna raise their hand and address something? Any uh, general general comments from our panelists? Like to make the eight minutes we have left. I just wanted to thank Linda and and John and uh, and everyone for uh, for inviting us to this panel and and getting us a chance to talk. And if if anybody has uh, some labor. Uh, experience experiences that they'd like to share. Uh, perhaps they could put them in the chat. Or, um, but uh, thank you very much. Yeah, or raise your hand if you have anything. If you know people who are in labor and you want to ask questions about that, or if you're wondering what what you all in your chapters can do to engage labor, raise your hand. I have a question that. Uh, it seems to me that when Cecil Roberts recently, uh, Cecil Roberts, the head of the United Mine Workers Association, he, he changed his his talking points uh, to from uh, you know we need coal jobs to we need jobs recently. Does anyone want to speak to that? That seems like a, a pretty big turning point uh, to me. I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's he reframing his thought of what he thought jobs were. I think there's, going back to what Mark was saying, there's a reality that's happening that as a leader, you, you know, you, you have to change. It's like, you can't keep saying the same thing when those things are going away. I mean, the reality is the reality. And they're not just going away because of its climate, it's also natural gas, the use of it is cheaper. So I think he's like, starting to understand that then the question is now how do you push their uh, local leaders their senators to now support things that's going to help them in the long run that's the next level first you have to acknowledge what is the reality <laughs> they need to do something about the reality so that's, that's i think that's a, a great thing with what he said and it's probably hard too because i mean it's not just coal jobs that that coal that's part of their that's part of their foundation of who they are and we have to understand that it's not just, hey, get, I can just move from, I think what uh, Peter said, from job to, that's just a job. No, you're talking about someone's culture. You know, what, you know, their grandfather, great-grandfather, everything that they, when we needed coal, they was there for us. You know, so now we learn something about coal, but do we just throw them away and say, well, you know, this is, this is coal. The people, some people died in their, you know, cancer in their lungs for that stuff. You know, their, their families and stuff like that. So I think it's a gradual, um, respectful pivot but to 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 honor their legacy of it and to and then take them to somewhere else but still respect that any uh, last minute comments from anyone now that we we've got five minutes left anybody um, uh, want to add something question for teachers um, is climate change an actual topic being taught in schools at any grade level now? My understanding is that it depends on the state. Uh, like I said, I, I live in the Midwest, um, Missouri formerly and now Kansas, and uh, it is it is barely uh, included in the curriculum here. Uh, I, I kind of go out of my way to loop it in a little bit, but uh, no, you don't have to learn much about it. 
Yeah, I think it, that uh, it's the, the school districts are always a little behind on this type of thing. So um, it would be great to see it more. And I think they're talking about it more. But as far as actually being in curriculum, I think it's very limited at this point. Um, uh, one thing that that uh, I, I don't know if I don't know if anyone is here from New Jersey right now, but I believe that New Jersey has mandated that climate be taught um, across the board uh, in, in, um, in, in, in schools at all subjects and grade levels. That's impressive. Uh, one thought that, that I have, um, and I don't know if there's time to react to, is um, I have a sense that the rise of, of Trump as an authoritarian had a lot to do with people's fear about work, about, um, and, and this relates very directly, I think, to where we are now, and that dealing with climate and climate and labor is essential to, uh, to move the needle, but in some senses also to help prevent um, the rise again of authoritarianism in this country if we've already started to deal with it. Any other thoughts from anyone before we wrap up here? We've just got a couple minutes left, so we'll take one more thought from anyone who wants to add something. Well, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you to everyone for uh, coming. I hope you had uh, so an insight or interesting that you hadn't had before uh, after hearing from uh, Mark, Johnny, and I. And thank you so much, Linda and John and Peter, for setting this up, for facilitating it. Um, I had a good time, and hopefully uh, it was productive. Yeah, thank, I want to thank uh, Mark and Johnny and, and uh, Kyle for joining, and uh, John and Peter for supporting. And... Um, I do want to mention if you're a CCL member, if you want to be involved with uh, labor, the labor outreach action team, you don't have to be a labor member. We have people do research, for example, to find CCL volunteers who are union members um, in our database. And so, and people can be involved that way. So you just go to your community page, um, hit connect, and then you'll see uh, action teams and you can select the labor outreach action team. And then you get invitations to our monthly meeting. So again, I really uh, want to thank everybody for joining. Um, it's about time to wrap up, but I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And um, and thank you so much for joining the discussion with us today about labor and climate. Good thank day, you, everyone. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, Carl. Thank, thank you, Linda. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, everybody.